I love the gospel story is portrayed in the Christmas message. It's included in Matthew, Luke, and John. Mark doesn't even mention the nativity, but it's included in Matthew, Luke, and the gospel of John, uh, the birth of Christ and what it was about. And one of the things that's very interesting is each gospel of the four gospels, each gospel has its own slant and its own particular emphases. They tell the same story, but they have their own particular slants. Uh, Luke's gospel is known for his treatment of underdogs and outcasts. In fact, Luke, Luke talks about, uh, spends chapter seven of his gospel talking mostly about Jesus' encounter with a, with a prostitute. In chapter 19, it's Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus, a tax collector. All through the Gospel of Luke, you find that you find that that featured are are women, and uh, because women weren't quite given given the consideration they are today, he t- features women, he features sinners, he features features tax collectors, and the reason I introduce what I'm about to read with that about Luke is because he tells a story about the birth of Christ in in Luke chapter two. And in a, in a way that surprised me when I first started trying to find out uh, about the culture of that day, it really surprised me to find out that he used an, an underdog group of people, the shepherds. And we'll talk about that, but here's the story as Luke tells it in Luke chapter two. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone round them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace peace to them on whom his favor rests. One of the things that really struck me was when I looked up shepherds and, and wanted to find out about the shepherds in Jesus' day, I found out that they weren't what I thought they would be. In Jesus' day, shepherds had been degraded and uh, they had Earlier in the Old Testament, shepherds were honored. In fact, God calls himself a shepherd. In Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, Jesus calls himself in the Gospel of John, the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. In Ezekiel 34, let me just read what Ezekiel said about shepherds. This is, for this is what the sovereign Lord says. This is the sovereign Lord, God himself saying, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them as a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them. So will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. And what's amazing to me is by Jesus day, shepherds weren't regarded highly. They weren't honored at all. In fact, they were despised and looked down on in Jesus day. I've got a quote here by Rabbi Gori, and this is what he, this is what he says of all the professions, professions you didn't want to go into. Let no man, said Gorian, make his son a muleteer, a camel driver, a barber, a sailor, a shepherd, an innkeeper, for as much as their craft is a craft of robbers. And so shepherds are listed in with, Mama, don't let your babies grow up to be this. And so shepherds is one of them. And so shepherds weren't highly thought of And the reason is, and this is a tragedy of legalism. This is one of the reasons I hate legalism. This is one of the reasons that I think religion without grace is so harmful and so detrimental to people's welfare. Religious leaders regarded shepherds with contempt and they looked down on them. They despised them. They considered them ceremonially ceremonially unclean. That meant that they couldn't wash their hands. They even had a rule about how much water you had to wash with to wash your hands before you ate. Their rule was you had to have half an eggshell at least full of water. Now that doesn't sound like much water, but the fact they had to measure it, it's just crazy. And so religion had had become not an introduction to God's grace, not an introduction to the love of God, but in Jesus' day, religion had become not inclusive, but exclusive. They kept people out. 
They had, to, they defined ways in which you couldn't, there was a saying, in fact, among the Pharisees, there was a saying that there's joy in heaven over one sinner who perishes. Jesus came and said, there's joy over one sinner who repents. A total reversal. And so legalism, laws and regulations and rules without love and without grace had become a real deterrent. And so the shepherds are included by Luke precisely because they were one of the despised groups, precisely because he reached out to the outcast. Why would Luke in particular do that? Well, Luke was a Gentile. He was converted under, under Paul's ministry. He knew what it was to be on the outside looking in. He knew what it was to be an excluded party. And he found Christ and he found grace through Paul's preaching and teaching. And when he comes along, he says, let me tell you, I'm not the first one from outside that got in. I was one of the ones, but it began with the shepherds. God announced to the shepherds with an angelic host, God announced to the shepherds that Jesus was born. Uh, Herod didn't get inv invited. Caesar Augustus didn't get invited. Quirinius, the governor, didn't get invited. But God goes outside all the ones that we think, the priest and the high priest in the temple, the announcement wasn't made. But God goes to shepherds who are despised and outcasts and he announces to them that the Savior has come. He announces to them joy to the whole world. And this is what he says. It's for everybody. It's good news for all the people. That means Gentiles. That means Wally Odom. That means you. That means that Christmas has got good news for everybody. A lot of people get excluded by religion. If you don't think that's true, just try going without all the all the precautions into some churches. If you're not dressed right, if you don't look right, if, they're, if you aren't keeping the rules, uh, honestly, you can be kept out of church because sometimes church doesn't become the place of grace. It becomes the place of legalism. It becomes the place of rules and regulations. Thank God for grace. God had grace in Christmas. One of the beauties of Christmas is the grace that God displayed. And one of the motivations of his grace was the fact that he went to he went to shepherds and, uh, who, who, uh, who were kept out and he brought them good news. By the way, the gospel is an advice. You can go to a bookstore or get on amazon.com and you can find all kinds of advice, advice how to lose weight, advice how to be a better husband, advice, how to, advice on how to be a better wife, advice on who to vote for politically, advice on, on anything you name. You can find advice on it. Advice doesn't help if you can't do it. It doesn't help if you can't keep it. The gospel isn't advice on if you do. The, every other religion, by the way, is advice. If you do this, you can please God. If you do this, you can be on the in crowd. If you do this, you can be included in God's plan. But only Christianity is news. It doesn't say give advice on what you're to do. It says it's been done already. It comes along and says, here's good news. In fact, the word evangelion in English, that word it was used in the Greek language. It was used to describe a messenger that would show up in a village when there was a new emperor. It would show up and he would announce. And it's, it's words used for that announcement that a herald would make. You go to a village square and say, we have a new emperor. A new emperor has been born. A, a new emperor has been declared. Well, I want to tell you what the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is. A new king has been named. He came to earth and you'll find him in a manger in Bethlehem and you'll find him as a baby, but don't be fooled. This baby rules the world. This baby has come to change your life. He's come to change society. And folks, 2020, here we are celebrating this Christmas that he's done just that. He's changed our world and he's still changing it. He's still changing people. He's still moving on, on hearts. And so he hasn't come just to be the king of emperors and rulers and the right kind of, of society. He's come to be the ruler and the king for everyone. He's come. He came to the shepherds. He wants us to know right from the start, if you're excluded by religion, he's not excluding you. If you're kept out because you don't keep the rules and can't wash properly and don't know the law. In fact, that's one thing that the shepherds were accused of. They couldn't keep the ceremonial law. They weren't even allowed to go to synagogue. They weren't allowed to go to church because they were, they were so outside the veil. They weren't allowed to, to participate in court. And a shepherd couldn't testify in court. Part of it, they, they said all shepherds are thieves. And, and here's the logic of that. 
the shepherds had sheep that ate grass that get, didn't grow on their own property. So they said, by, by the very nature of being a shepherd, they're stealing people's grass, and so they're thieves. And, and God came and he said, I've come for thieves, I've come for tax collectors, I've come for prostitutes, I've come for sinners, I've come for Gentiles, I've come for everybody. It's good news for the whole world. The whole world has a new king now, and his name is Jesus. And that's part of the glory of Christmas. Not only that, in a negative sense, but in a positive sense, look what Christmas did for all of us. These are the things that, these are the things that, that Christmas brought to us we recognize now as grace. Don't be afraid. We don't have to be afraid. I've, I've, met, I've met very few people who don't have something they're afraid of. I know a lot of Christians who are living in fear of punishment. God's going to punish me for what I've done. You ask God for forgiveness, you believe he forgave you, and then you walk in fear of punishment. God's going to get me. I used to think that God was waiting for me to fall. And I thought, in case I didn't just accidentally fall down, I thought God was throwing banana peels in front of me. And I was going to slip somewhere, and then God was going to come down with this hammer. He's just been waiting for the chance to do it. You know you don't have to fear punishment, not when you come to Jesus. He was punished for you. It's been taken care of already. He's, he's already done it. And so when the time comes for you to be punished, Jesus is going to say, hey, I, I paid that. I did that. It's not Wally's to pay. I've already paid for it. So you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid politically. What about the world? What's going to happen? It's under control. God hasn't given over the, the throne to anybody. Nobody has taken over the throne. Mussolini, Hitler, Mao Zedong, all of them came along and thought they were in charge. None of them were. Jesus is still in charge. He's still the one. Spiritually, boy, the self-righteous uh, legalists had taken over. Pharisees with their rules and regulations. You know who Jesus had the most trouble with? This is shocking to churchgoers, but he had the most trouble with people who went to church. Those were the ones that gave him trouble. Give Jesus a bunch of sinners and he'll eat with them. He'll love them. He'll change their lives. He'll transform them because they know they need help. But you take some self-righteous religious person who doesn't know he needs help. It's hard for Jesus to get through that. And so you don't have to be afraid of Jesus. You don't have to be afraid of God anymore as your friend, your best friend. He loves you more than you can imagine. Socially outcast, you don't have to be afraid <clears throat> that somehow society is going to turn on you because Jesus came for women and outcasts and sinners and Gentiles. He came for shepherds too, folks. He came for Wally. He visited my house. I was born in, I was born in, in coal mining country. My dad pastored coal miners. I was born in Appalachia. And uh, Jesus came to Appalachia, a town, a town that probably... They mispronounced when they named it. It's really Dante, the Italian poet, but they called it Dant. It was spelled like Dante, but they called it Dant. Well, that's what you do in Appalachia. And so the truth is, the truth, you have to fear nothing. Robert Lukak, who wrote the book, If God Be For Us, tells of a story in the New York Times. The New York Times published this story. They had a writing contest and these young kids wrote essays. And one little kid wrote an essay about twins. And this is what he said in his essay, and this is what the New York Times published. He said, there are more twins being born today than used to be because children are afraid, are afraid to come into the world by themselves. There is an explanation for twins, but that's not it. But it is true that sometimes you think, why would anyone, when, why would anyone want to bring a baby into a world like this? We don't have to be afraid. In fact, Christmas brings us this gift of grace, great joy. Great joy, that's incredible, that we can be happy. We can be joy, joyful in spite of, of unbearable religious burdens. You can be free of them. You can come to God's grace and love, and you can find out it's a joy to walk with Him. It's not like I have to give up so much. No, you gain everything. That's what it is to follow Jesus and to choose Him. And so religious burdens that are unbearable, you can have joy in spite of them. Political oppression, you can have joy in spite of that. Gwen and I have been in countries where political oppression is just the rule. First time we went to India, we went where there, we went where there were people being persecuted because they weren't Hindus. I went, the first time I went without her, I went to the home of a martyr. He was a Christian martyr who was killed by Hindus because he wouldn't worship their God. And they came in the middle of the night 
and they, and they assassinated him. We went and visited his family on the way to the camp we were doing. I'm telling you folks, in the midst of whatever is happening around you, pandemic, darkness, political oppression, I don't care what's going on, physical need, I don't care what's going on in your life, Jesus has come so that you may have joy and that joy is for everyone. And it's not just joy, folks, great joy. I don't know if you've ever had great joy, but great joy is just, it overwhelms everything you're up against. And another thing that he brought, salvation has come. G. Campbell Morgan said, the world didn't want an advisor. We've had enough advice and we can't keep it. The world didn't ask for a speculator who gave us his estimations of what might or might not happen. Everything that man could do had been done. And men sat in the darkness of their own wisdom, the darkness of our own wisdom. The world did not want a reformer. We couldn't change ourselves. What the world wanted was a savior. Jesus didn't come to keep us in our same condition. Jesus didn't come to just say, I feel sorry for you. Jesus came to save us and he's still saving. He saved me. Most of you listening to me have probably experienced him as savior. If you haven't, I invite you to do that because he's still the savior. He's a still, he still saves people from their sins, from their, from their misery, from their failure. He's still the savior. And not only that, but he gives us peace. All the angels, the first part of this passage is one angel talking to the shepherds. Then all of a sudden, a bunch of angels show with them and you know what their message is? Peace on earth. Do you, do you, do you get that? Peace on earth. I know there'll be peace in heaven. There won't be sin there. The devil won't be there. Lots of problems won't be there. Sickness won't be there. I know that we'll never fail once we get there. I know there'll be peace in heaven, but folks, the Christmas message, and it's a message of grace, there's peace on earth. There's peace right now. There's peace where you live. There's peace in your darkest hour. There's peace where you're frustrated. Peace that's come, why? Because of Christmas. Peace was initiated into our world in spite of the fact that there were problems, political problems with Rome, religious problems with the Pharisees and Sadducees who had wandered very far from what God had in mind. All kinds of problems, there were social problems. The poor were everywhere. And there was all kinds, of, all kinds of disease. Jesus went everywhere healing the sick because there were so many sick that became part of his message. But I want to tell you something, a savior has been born. And that's the message and he's brought peace on earth. Peace to Warrington, where I live. Peace to where you live. Peace to your family. Peace to your life. I read a story by Bob Woods. He tells about a family <clears throat> that went to Carlsbad Caverns for the first time. They had a seven-year-old daughter, 11-year-old son, and they went with their kids. They got down in the bottom of the cavern and it sometimes happened. Gwen and I experienced it in Skyline Cavern. And uh, when, you, when you get in the deepest part of the cavern, they turn out all the lights. And that's the blackest black, that's the darkest dark. There's absolutely no light, no street lights, no moon, no stars, it's absolutely dark. And so when they got to the bottom, of the cave, <coughs> Carlsberg Caverns, they turned off all the lights and it was absolutely pitch dark. The seven-year-old girl started to cry and because uh, she was afraid, all of a sudden she's enveloped in darkness. And the voice of her older brother, who's 11, spoke up, he had great wisdom. He spoke up and everyone could hear him. He said, don't cry. Somebody here knows how to turn the lights on. And I promise you folks, I don't care how dark it gets, somebody here, knows how to turn the lights on. He can turn the lights on in your darkness. He can turn the lights on in your pain. He can turn the lights on in your sin. He can turn the lights on and bring joy wherever you are. And that's because of Christmas. So we don't just celebrate a holiday, we celebrate the fact that light came into our darkness and the world didn't understand him and some still don't but the lights are on because light prevails over darkness. Jesus has come. And I want you to give thanks with me for that. So let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that in our dark world, the light really came on Christmas day. And thank you that there's joy. Thank you that there's peace on earth. 
Thank you, the joy is for everyone. Thank you that the good news of grace is for everyone. And thank you that a savior has come to save us, not just to tell us how bad we are and not just to point out our sin, but he's come to actually save us and redeem us. And we ask you this day, Lord, to let us enjoy the blessings of the miracle of Christmas. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.